Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to uh, cover is the concept of a subgroup. Okay, right. So, to motivate the definition of a subgroup, I'm just going to uh, go over the definition of a group once again. So, I'll just uh, revisit the definition of a group, okay, and then we'll uh, define what a subgroup is, and then we'll move on to some examples. Okay, right. Uh, so, firstly, let's just revisit the definition of a group then. Okay, so remember what a group is. So, a group is fundamentally a set. It's often denoted at capital G like so. Okay, and fundamentally it is a set of elements, so you make a set of symbols basically. So here is my set of symbols, and what you're going to do is define a composition law on this set of symbols. Okay, so you are going to define what any two elements of this set compose together is equal to, basically. Okay, so if we let little x and little y denote arbitrary elements of big G, so they are variables, basically, they can be any element of this set big G, then you need to define what little x composed with little y is equal to. You need to define what these two elements mixed together, combined together, is going to be equal to. Okay, so what you end up having to create is a composition table, like so. Okay, and often we'll call the composition just abstract composition, and we'll uh, call that little circle like so. Okay, and what you'll do is you'll give every element of the group here, every element of this set, you'll give it a row devoted to it. So every element of our set will have a row devoted to it. So you'll put all the elements of the set down here, okay, devoting the corresponding row to those elements. And then you'll also put all of the elements of G up here, okay, and you'll devote a column to each element to the group. Okay, and then what you will go through and do is you will define what all of the entries here are. So if you find little x, um, the little x elements row, okay, and you find the little y elements column, you will then put the answer in there, which is little x composed with little y. Okay, and you will fill in all the entries of that composition table there. Okay, so a group fundamentally is a set with a composition law uh, like so defined on it, basically. Okay, now, in order to actually be considered a group, however, this composition law needs to obey certain axioms, the axioms of group theory, basically. Okay, it has to have some special properties uh, that um, give it uh, very fancy um, features, basically. They, for instance, allow us to solve equations in it. Okay, so it has to have a bunch of fancy properties that make it interesting. Okay, because, of course, you could define this however you like, but you wouldn't end up necessarily with a mathematical structure that is worth your time studying it. Okay, so the axioms of group theory make this structure interesting, basically. Okay, and let's just recite off what the axioms of group theory are. So number one is the most easy to understand. This is closure, okay, and what this says is that uh, all of the answers in the composition table have to be another element of our original set here. So you can't suddenly compose two elements of the group together and get something outside of the group. So you can't get a symbol that wasn't in your original set over here. Okay, so uh, the answers to the composition uh, have to be back within your group, basically. That's what closure means. Okay, right, so that's axiom number one, that all of the answers here have to be elements from our group. Okay, axiom number two is the most subtle, okay, and this is associativity, okay, your composition law needs to obey the associative law. Now what this means is that if you compose three elements together, it doesn't matter where you put the brackets. So if you consider, let's say, three little elements, let's have little a composed with little b composed with little c, where little a, b, and c are just arbitrary elements of our group. So I'll just put this in. So little a, b, and c are just elements of our group. So how can you do that? How, what does this actually mean? Because our composition law doesn't tell us how to compose three things together. Okay, so to make this actually mean something, we need to reduce this problem of composing three things together into the problem of composing two things together. So the way that we do that is by putting some brackets in here. So for instance, we can put brackets around A composed with B. Okay, so what this now means is first compose A with B. So work out what the answer 
answer there is. Closure tells us that that will be another symbol within our group. So get the answer and then compose the answer with C. And again, that's just a composition of two things, basically. Okay, so that's a way that you can actually end up composing three things together, okay, by putting the brackets around like so. However, there's another way that you could do this, okay, which is that you can also put the brackets around B composed with C. So you can say that this is compose B and C together firstly to get an answer, and then take A and compose it with that answer, basically. And the associative law says that these two different ways of doing it have to give the same answer, basically, so that there is only one answer to what these three things composed together are, basically. Okay, so this is the associative law here, that it, you can put the brackets in either of these positions and it does not affect the answer that you get, okay? And we have seen in previous videos how the intuitive way of thinking about how you actually get associativity is by thinking of the symbols in your group as representing set permutations of some set and then the composition law of those symbols that we have here as representing the composition of the set permutations that the symbols represent and then the answer that you then have is just the overall set permutation of the two set permutations composed together. Again, when you think in that way, associativity becomes very obvious. However, if you were just to arbitrarily make up the entries in this composition table, you would not achieve associativity in all likelihood. It's very, very difficult. Okay, right. Uh, so that's a really, really important property. So axiom number three, then, is that we need an identity element. Okay, so we need some elements within the group that composes with all el other elements of the group to give back the other element of the group. So basically, this means that there needs to exist some element, which we often denote E, okay, which is an element of the group, such that when you compose E with G on the left, like so, okay, it just gives little g back again, and that's for all little g is an element of big G, and it works the other way around as well. So if you do little g composed with the identity, that will also equal little g. Okay, so this has to be true for all elements of the group. I can put in as little g here whatever element of the group you like, including the identity itself, okay, and it will always just give that arbitrary other element of the group back again, okay, and it doesn't matter which way you do the composition around, basically, okay, that has to be true. So there has to be an element in the group for which this is true. And we've seen in terms of thinking of the uh, symbols of uh, the group as representing set permutations of some set, and the composition law as representing uh, the composition of the set permutations that they represent, that this is equivalent to saying that the identity map, the identity set permutation, has to be represented by some symbol within your group. And when you compose the identity set permutation with any other set permutation, it will just give you back that arbitrary other set permutation, basically, and that's true whichever way you uh, compose them, basically. Okay, right, and finally, axiom number four is the inverse axiom, okay? All elements of the group have to have an inverse element, okay? So, uh, this means that, oh, actually, I've missed a bit out, okay? So, for all little g is an element of big G, so take any arbitrary symbol in our group here, okay, that's all that says, so take any one of these symbols, okay, and for all of them, it's going to be true that there exists another element, which we'll call G inverse, which is an element of big G, so there's another element in big G. Now note that it's not necessarily a distinct element, G inverse might actually be G in some cases, okay, but there is an element within G, which will denote G inverse, okay, such that um, G composed with G inverse gives the identity. So the answer of what G composed with G inverse is, is the identity. And also, if you do it the other way around, G inverse composed with G also gives you the identity, basically. Okay, so for all elements of the group, you have to have another element that isn't necessarily a different element to it, but there has to be an element also within the group that will compose either way round with that initial element that you chose to give the identity back again.
Okay, right. And again, in terms of thinking about the elements of a group as representing uh, set permutations of some set and the composition law as representing the composition of those set permutations, uh, then this is equivalent to saying that for any set permutation that is represented within our group, you have to have another symbol representing the inverse set permutation of that set permutation, basically. Okay, now, in some cases, the inverse of a set permutation will be the same set permutation, and those will be the cases where uh, the inverse element of the element of the group will be itself, basically, so where the element of the group will be its own inverse. Okay, so if the, an element of the group represents a set permutation which is its own inverse, then that element of the group will also have as its inverse itself, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so that's what uh, the inverse condition means in terms of our way of thinking about groups in terms of uh, symbols representing set permutations of some other set. Okay, right. So those are the axioms of a group. Okay, right. So now we've gone over that again. Let's now go on to the concept of a subgroup. Okay, so a subgroup, which is often denoted capital H, is fundamentally a subset of G. Okay, so we can put that it's a subset of G. Okay, uh, so what you're going to do is potentially take uh, a, a, a sub-collection of the elements of G here. Okay, so G is a set containing lots of symbols. Now, to create this subgroup H, what you need to start off by doing is just creating a subset of this. So, a sub-collection of the elements here. Okay, now, remember that when we say a subset, it doesn't necessarily mean a proper subset. Okay, so the whole group itself is actually a subset. Okay, so if you took the set containing all of the elements in this set, that is considered a subset of this set. Okay, it's considered the improper subset or a trivial subset. Okay, um, however, the proper subsets are the ones that are going to be more interesting in this case, which are the ones where you don't have all the elements of the group in your subset, basically. Okay, so what you're going to do is then take a sub-collection of the elements within your group, okay? So the, our, if we're taking a proper sub-collection, there will be elements in the group that are not in our subset here, okay? So here is our subset H, okay? And then what you're going to do is you will have a composition law on this H, which you inherit from the composition law on G, okay? Because H is a subset of G. So what we can do is we can consider this set H, which I'll write down here. So this is our set H, which is this subset of G. Okay, and I'll colour code it in here. So here is H, our subset of G. Okay, it's now down here. Okay, and we can easily define a composition law on this set H, which is just the inherited composition law from G. Okay? So you can put all elements of H up here, so you can give every single element that is in a big H here, uh, a column in our composition table, and you can also give every single one a row in our composition table, and then you can go through and define what any two arbitrary elements in H, let's say little x and little y, which are arbitrary elements of big H, we can then define easily what little x composed with little y is, and how are we going to do this? Well, we're just going to steal the answer, basically, from our composition law on the larger group, basically, G. Okay, so we'll just say, okay, all of these elements in big H were elements in G, and therefore the answer of what any two of these elements in big H composed together is equal to is somewhere within this composition table here. So when defining this new composition table, okay, which just now involves the elements of our subset big H, all we have to do is go and look at the answers in the composition table for big G and steal them, basically, copy them down into this composition table. Okay, so brilliant. We've got now a subset at the moment with a composition law defined on it. For this subset with this composition law defined on it to be considered a subgroup, okay, this structure that I now have here needs to be a group. Okay, it needs to obey group axioms. Okay, so you have to take a very clever subset so that this subset with this composition law on it obeys all of the axioms of group theory. If that is true, then we say that H is a subgroup of the group G. Okay, and we write it like so. We will write capital H 
is less than capital G, and this means is a subgroup of uh, big G. So you should read this, uh, big H is a subgroup of big G. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, let's just think about how uh, this will uh, achieve this. Okay, so it now needs to obey these axioms here. So let's just look at these axioms again. So we've got closure. Now this suddenly becomes non-trivial. Closure was always a, a bit of a trivial one in the case of defining a group from scratch because it always seemed a bit obvious that we were going to make the answers actual elements of the group. But now it suddenly becomes important. Okay, we need all the answers in this composition table to be elements of H. Now that's not necessarily going to be true if you just take an arbitrary subset of G basically. Because what's to stop the answers to, for instance, little x composed with little y being an element of G that is outside of H? Okay, so some element of big G that is not an element of our subset H, okay? Uh, because all we know is that this was a group, okay? All the answers in this composition table were in the group big G, but we do not have any assurance at all that uh, when we look at this subset big H and we look at the composition law uh, restricted down just to the elements of big H, that we're not going to end up with answers in this composition table that are outside of big H at, but which are within G. We know of course that they'll always end up being within big G, but we're not assured at all that we're not going to end up with an element that's not in big H but is within big G. Okay, so closure suddenly becomes important. That was the one that we viewed as a bit trivial when we were defining a group from scratch. But in the case of subgroups, it suddenly becomes very important that the subgroup, this subset of our larger group, big G, needs to be closed under composition. So any two elements of this subset, big H, composed together, need to give back another element of that subset, basically. Okay, so closure. Now, the most non-trivial, the most difficult one when you're defining a group from scratch, associativity suddenly becomes the trivial one in the case of subgroups, okay? We get associativity no matter whether our subset here with this composition law obeys any of the other axioms. We do get associativity, okay? Because if this composition law did not obey associativity, then it would imply that the composition law on our larger group did not obey associativity. Okay, and uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to call it there for this video. We'll continue on in the next uh, video.